The clock in Jake's apartment read 1.37 a.m., but neither he nor Lucas seemed to notice the late hour. The small living room, cluttered with empty pizza boxes and half-drunk coffee mugs, felt even smaller that night. The TV blared the latest election debate, its sound harsh and punctuated by the sharp voices of the candidates, who seemed more focused on attacking each other than addressing any real issues. Jake rubbed his eyes, the weight of the election fatigue pressing on him like a physical thing. I can't take this anymore, he muttered, staring at the screen. Lucas, sprawled out on the couch, stared back at him, his expression one of resignation. You mean the same thing we've been watching for the past two hours? Endless arguments over who's more corrupt, who's more out of touch with reality, who's promising things they can't deliver. It's exhausting. Jake laughed bitterly. It's more than exhausting, it's frustrating. It's like a circus with no end in sight, and we're supposed to pick the lesser evil, as if that even means anything anymore. Lucas took a deep breath, flicking the remote to mute the debate. The silence in the room was heavy, as if the absence of noise made everything seem more real, more pressing. Do you ever think, Lucas started, his voice quieter than usual, that we're just stuck? Like, we're part of this system that's broken, but we don't know how to fix it. Jake leaned back in his chair, rubbing his neck. He knew what Lucas meant. Both of them had just graduated from college. They were supposed to be starting their lives, full of hope and ambition, ready to make a difference in the world. Instead, they found themselves adrift in a sea of political gridlock, economic uncertainty, and a society that seemed to be losing its sense of direction. Their generation was expected to solve the problems of the world, but it felt like they were barely holding it together themselves. I think about it every day, Jake admitted. But what are we supposed to do? The system's too big. The problems are too big. It's like no matter what we do, we're just a drop in the ocean. There was a long pause. The hum of the refrigerator was the only sound in the apartment. Lucas sat up, rubbing his hands together as if trying to conjure an idea from thin air. Maybe, maybe we need to get out of here. Leave all of this behind for a while. Go somewhere. See something else. Jake raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? Like a vacation? Lucas shook his head. Not just a vacation, a journey, a real one. Not the kind where you just go to a beach and forget about everything. I'm talking about something that makes us think. Something that makes us see the world from a different angle. I don't know. Maybe we'll understand the bigger picture if we just experience it ourselves. Jake stared at him, still processing the idea. A journey. But a journey to where? You want us to just... Drop everything and go? No plan, no idea where we're headed? Lucas shrugged. Maybe that's the point. Maybe if we just let go of all the expectations, we'll find answers we weren't even looking for and it doesn't have to be fancy. I'm thinking, a road trip, a cross-country one. Jake's heart skipped a beat. He knew what Lucas was suggesting, something wild and free. He imagined it, driving through the open roads, away from the noise, away from the political chaos and the expectations of what their lives should be. No deadlines, no debates, just the endless horizon stretching out before them. Wait, are you serious? Jake asked, a smile creeping across his face despite the tension. You're talking about packing up our bags and just hitting the road? Lucas grinned, his eyes sparkling with a mix of excitement and rebellion. Exactly. Just us, our bikes, and the road. We'll start from here, head south, then west, then wherever. I don't care. I think we need this. We need to see things, meet people, talk to strangers. Maybe we'll find out more about ourselves, or maybe we'll just get a taste of what's real beyond all the nonsense they feed us. Jake was silent for a moment, weighing the idea. He could already feel the weight lifting off his shoulders. For months, he had been buried under the constant pressure of the election, work applications, and trying to figure out where he fit in the world. This, this felt like a chance to breathe. I'm in, Jake said suddenly, a grin breaking across his face. I mean, why not? What else are we doing? We could spend another year arguing about what's wrong with the system, 
or we could actually see something for ourselves. Hell, maybe we'll find the answers we've been looking for. Lucas laughed, relieved that Jake was on board. Exactly. Maybe we won't solve the world's problems, but we'll figure out how to deal with them on our terms. And hey, if nothing else, at least we'll have an epic story to tell when we get back. Jake stood up, a new sense of purpose filling him. He grabbed his jacket from the back of the chair. All right, let's do it. No more waiting for change. Let's go find it. The two friends exchanged a look of determination, as if they had already made the decision, as if the world had already shifted beneath their feet. And in a way, it had. The debate, the political chaos, the divisions. It was all still there, waiting for them to confront it when they returned. But for now, they had something more important, a road ahead full of unknowns and possibilities. We leave tomorrow, Lucas said, his voice steady, almost as if he were making a promise to the universe itself. Jake nodded, his mind already racing with possibilities. Tomorrow it is. And so, with the decision made, they turned off the TV and packed their bags. Tomorrow would be the beginning of something new, something that couldn't be found in a debate or a vote or any political platform. Tomorrow would be the start of their journey. The hum of the motorcycle engines was a steady rhythm in the early morning air as Jake and Lucas cruised down the narrow, winding roads of upstate New York. The sun was still low in the sky, casting long shadows over the landscape, while the trees along the roadside seemed to stretch out lazily, their leaves whispering with the wind. The cool breeze was a welcome contrast to the stifling city they had left behind, and with each mile they covered, the tension in Jake's shoulders seemed to ease a little more. This is what it's supposed to feel like, Jake said, his voice carrying over the roar of his bike. The road, the freedom, the feeling that everything's open. Lucas glanced over at him, a grin on his face. Yeah, it's like the whole world just opened up. No deadlines, no debates. No politicians telling us how to feel. Just us and the road. The further they went, the more the landscape shifted. From the bustling streets of New York City to the quiet, almost eerie stillness of the small towns they passed through, it felt like they were traveling through different worlds. The air smelled different here, cleaner, fresher, and the people they encountered seemed somehow more grounded, as though they had time to think about what really mattered. Their first stop was a small town in the Catskills, a place that seemed frozen in time. The main street was lined with brick buildings, many of them faded and worn, and there was a sense of nostalgia in the air, as if the town had once been more than it was now. As they parked their bikes in front of a dusty diner, the bell above the door jingled as they entered. The diner was practically empty, save for a few older men sitting at the counter, nursing coffee and chatting in low voices. Jake and Lucas sat down at a booth near the window and a waitress, who couldn't have been much older than them, came over to take their order. Two coffees, Black, Jake said, looking around the diner. Coming right up, the waitress said before walking away, leaving the two friends to absorb the quiet hum of small-town life. As they sipped their coffee, Lucas noticed an older man sitting alone at the far end of the counter his hands weathered and worn, his face lined with age and experience. There was something about him that made Lucas pause. Maybe it was the way he looked at them, as if he could tell they didn't quite belong in this place. Hey, Lucas said, tipping his head toward the man. Why don't we ask him about the town? Jake shrugged. Sure, why not? Maybe he knows something about what's really going on around here. They got up and walked over to the man. He looked up from his coffee, his eyes squinting slightly as if trying to place them. You boys from around here? The man asked in a voice that had a gravelly warmth to it. Not exactly, Jake said, smiling. We're on a road trip, just passing through. Thought we'd stop and get the lay of the land. The man grinned, a dry chuckle escaping him. I've lived here my whole life. Can't say much has changed except maybe fewer folks come through these days. Towns seen better times, but we manage. We always do. Must be tough, Lucas said, genuinely curious. The whole economy thing, the way small towns are struggling. What's your take on it? The man sighed, his eyes narrowing slightly. 
Tough? Hell, it's more than tough, it's a fight. People here used to work in the factories, you know? A lot of folks worked at the mill down the road, had a good thing going. But when the factories moved out, so did everything else. Folks lost their jobs, their homes. Now we're stuck in this weird in-between, trying to hang on to something that's already slipping away. That sounds like everywhere, Jake said quietly. Things are broken and nobody seems to have the answers. The election's just around the corner, but I feel like none of the candidates are talking about real change. They're just fighting over who's worse than the other. The old man looked at him closely, as if weighing his words. You know, when I was young, I fought for something that mattered. I was part of the union back in the day. We fought for better wages, better working conditions. It was a struggle, but we believed in it. We believed we could make things better. Now, I don't know. It's all about power, money, and who can control the system. The workers don't have a voice anymore. That's what we've been thinking too, Lucas said. Everything seems so... rigged. Like the whole system is set up for the people at the top, and nobody down here can do anything about it. The old man nodded slowly, looking out the window as if he were seeing a past long gone. You're right. But that's the thing. People like you, like me, we have to keep fighting. We can't give up. Even if it feels like the world is against us. You want to change things? Start by doing something, anything, that's how it starts. And if enough of us get together, we can still make a difference. But you gotta start somewhere. His words hung in the air for a moment, and Jake and Lucas exchanged a look, both of them feeling the weight of his experience. There was a kind of quiet power in his voice, something that suggested he had lived through enough struggles to know that, even when everything felt hopeless, there was always room for resistance. We appreciate you talking to us, Jake said, standing up. It means a lot to hear it from someone who's been there. The old man smiled. Yeah, well, keep your heads up. And remember, change doesn't come from waiting for it. It comes from doing something about it. As they left the diner, the two friends were quiet, the gravity of the conversation settling on them like a heavy cloak. The road stretched out before them, long and uncertain but now they felt a little less lost. The old man's words had planted something inside them, a seed of purpose. As they fired up their bikes and roared off down the road, they knew one thing for sure. Their journey wasn't just about seeing the country, it was about understanding it, learning from the people they met along the way, and maybe, just maybe, figuring out what they could do to make it a little bit better. Think we'll find answers out here? Lucas asked, eyes focused on the horizon. Jake grinned, his voice full of determination. I don't know, but I think we're going to find something that matters. The air in Michigan felt heavier than it had in the quieter towns they passed through. The once calm countryside was now replaced with the bustling streets of a city on the brink of Election Day. Everywhere they looked, there were election posters plastered on buildings flyers being handed out by eager volunteers, and heated debates echoing in every corner of the town. The excitement was palpable, but it carried an undercurrent of tension. Something was at stake here, and it wasn't just the future of the country. It was the way people viewed the very foundation of their lives. Jake and Lucas rolled their bikes into the heart of the city, their helmets reflecting the neon signs and towering billboards that lit up the night. It felt like a world away from the open roads and quiet towns they had encountered earlier. The political energy was thick in the air, and as they parked near a small community center, they could hear the sounds of a local town hall meeting in progress. The door was slightly ajar, and the murmur of voices inside was urgent, passionate, a mix of frustration and hope. Think we should check it out? Jake asked, looking at Lucas, who nodded. Why not? We've come this far, and I'm curious to hear what people here are saying about the candidates. Inside the meeting hall, the room was packed with local residents, most of them middle-aged or older, their faces weathered with years of hard work and in many cases, uncertainty. A large banner on the wall read, The Future of Michigan, Together or Divided. It was a question, but no one in the room seemed to have an answer. The debate was already in full swing, 
As Jake and Lucas slipped into the back, they overheard various groups discussing the two major candidates. One, a young reformist with promises of change and radical policy shifts. The other, a seasoned politician advocating for tradition, stability, and cautious progress. The conversation was polarized, everyone having made up their minds long before the meeting had even started. One of the speakers, a woman in her fifties with fiery red hair and a sharp voice, was talking about the need for a complete overhaul of the system. We can't keep pretending everything is fine, she said, slamming her fist against the podium. The system is rigged and it's time to break it. We need a candidate who will make the tough decisions, who isn't afraid to upset the apple cart. The old ways don't work anymore. Jake leaned forward, nodding. He'd been hearing similar sentiments all along the journey. People who were tired, people who felt abandoned by the system, desperate for something new. This woman's passion was infectious, and he could see how people were rallying around her. I think she has a point, Jake said softly to Lucas. Maybe the only way to fix things is to really shake things up. We need someone who's going to challenge everything. The old guard, the corruption, the lies. We need reform. Lucas looked around the room, his arms crossed. I'm not so sure, he replied, his voice low but firm. Change is great in theory, but there's always a cost. People don't realize that. These radical shifts, they're dangerous. They can tear everything apart. We've got a system in place, and I think it's better to work within it, to improve it gradually, not blow it up. Jake turned to look at him, surprised. So, you're really going to sit here and tell me you're okay with the way things are? You want to trust the same people who've been failing us for decades? Nothing's going to change unless we demand it. I didn't say I'm okay with it, Lucas shot back, his voice rising. But I'd rather take the safer route. What happens if the reformists are wrong? What if all this talk of change only makes things worse? I'm not willing to gamble everything just because someone promises hope. The tension in the room thickened, and both Jake and Lucas were drawn deeper into the debate. A man near them turned to join in, his face red with emotion. These guys are all the same, just politicians with different masks, he yelled. You can't trust either side. Both of them want to keep us controlled, keep us stuck in their systems. They only care about power. Maybe it's time we stopped listening to angry voices and started listening to the people who actually know how to fix things. A woman on the other side of the room responded sharply. The system's not broken because of the people. It's broken because the wrong people are running it. The arguments grew louder, and Jake could feel the temperature of the room rising. It was clear that the town was divided, just like the rest of the country. No one seemed to be willing to listen to the other side, each group entrenched in their own beliefs, their own fears. The debate wasn't about solving problems anymore. It was about choosing sides, about winning or losing. Maybe we should go, Lucas suggested quietly, his voice strained. This isn't helping. It's just making everything worse. Jake was silent for a moment, torn between the urge to argue and the realization that nothing would be solved here. The shouting, the anger, it was too much. They had come to find answers, but all they were seeing was more conflict, more division. They stood up and walked toward the exit, the weight of the conversation heavy in the air. As they stepped outside into the cool evening, the city lights flickering above them, the tension between them was palpable. You really believe in this reformist stuff, don't you? Lucas asked, his voice quieter now but still edged with frustration. Jake ran a hand through his hair. I don't know, man. I just feel like something has to change. I don't think we can wait around for things to get better on their own. But I get what you're saying. Maybe I'm just too idealistic. Maybe we can't just throw everything away and start over. Lucas looked at him, his face softening slightly. It's not about being idealistic. It's about being realistic. Change doesn't come easy. It comes through compromise, through working within the system, not tearing it down and hoping for the best. Jake sighed, glancing at his bike. I get it, but sometimes I wonder if waiting for the system to fix itself is just another form of giving up. They stood in silence for a long moment, the noise of the town hall meeting still ringing in their ears. It wasn't just the noise of the people inside the building. 
It was the noise of their own conflict, the clash of their beliefs, their hopes, their fears. Neither of them had answers. They only had questions. And those questions for now would have to wait. We should get some sleep, Lucas said, his voice calm but distant. We'll figure this out in the morning. Jake nodded, but as they mounted their bikes and rode off into the night, he couldn't shake the feeling that their journey had just entered a new phase, one where the road wasn't just about discovering America, but discovering themselves. The southern heat pressed against them as Jake and Lucas arrived in a small town nestled on the edge of the Mississippi Delta. The air was thick with humidity, the kind of heat that made everything feel slow and heavy, as if the very atmosphere was weighed down by the struggles of the people living here. It was a town that seemed forgotten by the rest of the country, and yet its problems, the stark divide between the rich and poor, the tensions around race, and the crushing grip of economic decline, were problems that reflected the heartache of many other places across America. After a few days apart, the two friends had decided to meet up again, hoping the space between them might help clear the air after their tense argument back in Michigan. The time apart had given both of them a chance to think more clearly, but they still carried the weight of their differences, unsure how to bridge the gap between their views. The road had not brought easy answers, and the political climate, as they were learning, was only growing more fractured by the day. They agreed to meet at a community center in the heart of the town, a worn-down building that looked like it had seen better days. It stood as a testament to the area's resilience, with murals painted on the walls showing scenes of local history, moments of pride, but also moments of struggle. The air inside the building was cool and smelled faintly of old paper and coffee. The hum of conversation buzzed as people milled about, many of them young, some of them tired, but all of them working in one way or another to make their town better. Jake arrived first, his bike idling by the entrance as he waited for Lucas. The town felt different from the others they had visited. It was more tense, more alive with the buzz of action, but the energy was also laced with frustration. The streets outside were filled with empty storefronts, and there was an undercurrent of anger in the way people talked about the economy, the police, and the political leaders they felt had abandoned them. When Lucas pulled up beside him, he didn't need to say much. Both of them could feel the tension hanging in the air, but they also felt the pull of something else. A desire to learn, to understand, to find the answers they had been searching for since they started their journey. Inside the community center, they were greeted by a young woman named Emily. She had short cropped hair, a bright smile, and an energy that made her seem much older than her years. She introduced herself as a volunteer who had been working in the community for the past several years, and she seemed genuinely happy to meet them. Glad you could make it, Emily said, shaking both of their hands with a firm grip. I think you'll find this place different, but in a good way. As she led them to a back room, Jake and Lucas could see the heart of what she was talking about. The space was filled with young people, mostly in their twenties sitting at tables, organizing, planning, and collaborating. There were signs on the walls, posters for local events, and stacks of petitions, all designed to address the town's most pressing issues, poverty, racial inequality, and economic decline. It was a community of young people determined to change their surroundings, and their energy was contagious. This is where we get things done, Emily said, gesturing to the group. We're a grassroots organization. We focus on direct action, things like organizing food drives, setting up job training programs, working with the local police to de-escalate tensions, that kind of thing. We're not waiting around for politicians to fix things. We're doing it ourselves. Jake and Lucas exchanged a glance. It was different from what they had expected, but in a way, it felt like a breath of fresh air. There were no empty promises, no grand speeches, just action. It was a stark contrast to the political rallies and debates they had seen in the cities they had passed through. Here, the focus was on practical solutions, not empty words. Emily sat them down at one of the tables and began to explain more about the group's work. I know it's easy to get discouraged, she said, looking at them both seriously. The economy's terrible, 
and the political climate is a mess. But we can't just sit around complaining about it. We have to take the power back. And that starts with us, young people who still believe we can make a difference. Lucas, still skeptical about the radical change that many reformists advocated, raised an eyebrow. But do you really think we can change things from the ground up? It seems like the system is too big, too powerful. We've seen it all, the promises, the campaigns, the lies. Doesn't it feel like we're just spinning our wheels? Emily smiled, but there was a hard edge to her eyes. I get it. I really do. I felt the same way before. But here's the thing. Change doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen in one big sweep. It happens in small ways through persistent action, through showing up even when it feels like you're not making a dent. The system is big, sure. But the people who run it? They can't ignore us forever. And if we keep pushing, we'll start to see real change. Jake was silent for a moment, processing her words. It's like what that old man in New York said, he finally said, his voice soft. He told us we had to start somewhere. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the way forward. Emily nodded. Exactly. It's not about one big idea or one big candidate who's going to fix everything. It's about what we do together. We might not change everything in one election, but we can change our communities, our neighborhoods, and that's where it begins. Over the next few hours, Emily and the other volunteers shared their stories, how they had gotten involved, what they were fighting for, and how they managed to keep going even when things felt impossible. It was inspiring, and yet sobering, to see the reality of what they were up against. This town, like so many others, was struggling. The economy was broken, the racial tensions were high, and the political polarization only seemed to make everything worse. But here, in this small, overheated room, they weren't waiting for someone else to fix things. They were rolling up their sleeves and doing it themselves. As they left the community center later that evening, Lucas and Jake both felt a shift inside them. There was still uncertainty, still doubt about the road ahead, but there was also a flicker of hope a realization that they didn't have to wait for some far-off ideal to take root in Washington. The future could be shaped right here in small ways by people like Emily and her group. We might not have all the answers, Jake said as they walked toward their bikes, the weight of the day sinking in. But I think we're starting to see how the real work gets done. It's not about waiting for the perfect politician. It's about what we're willing to do ourselves. Lucas nodded slowly, his expression thoughtful. Yeah, it's about people like us making the choice to step in and make a difference. I think I'm starting to get it. As they started their engines and rode off into the dusk, the world seemed a little less daunting, a little more within their reach. The road stretched ahead of them, but this time, they knew they weren't just looking for answers. They were beginning to understand that the road itself was part of the answer. The ride back to New York was quieter than their journey out. The miles stretched on endlessly, the open road offering no answers, only the soft hum of their engines and the rhythmic pulse of their tires against the asphalt. Jake and Lucas rode side by side, but the distance between them seemed greater now, not in miles, but in understanding. Their travels had shaped them, leaving a mark on their hearts and minds that they couldn't easily explain. The sights along the way, the small towns, the faces of strangers, the voices of people they'd met, had all blurred together in a haze of memories. But what lingered most clearly in their minds wasn't any one encounter, but the feeling of change that had taken root in them. They hadn't found all the answers they'd been searching for, but they had found something else, a deeper understanding of themselves, and the realization that even in a world so large and complex, their actions could still matter. When they finally rolled into New York, the city felt different. The skyline loomed over them, towering and imposing, but there was something less intimidating about it now. It wasn't just a symbol of everything wrong with the world. It was a place where people lived, where things could still change, one person at a time. The first few days back were a blur, catching up with old friends, finding time to reflect, and trying to adjust to the fast pace of city life again. 
But something inside Jake had shifted. He found himself thinking more about the conversations they'd had with people on their trip, especially the time spent in that community center in the South with Emily and her group. What she had said about taking action, about not waiting for someone else to fix the problems, kept running through his mind. One evening, after a quiet dinner with his family, Jake sat alone on the rooftop of his apartment building, the city lights flickering below him like a thousand stars. He pulled out his phone and found Emily's number. He had kept it from their time in the South, but it hadn't felt important until now. Hey, Emily, he typed, his fingers slow but sure. I think I'm ready. I want to help. I want to join your group, get involved in the community. I don't know exactly how I can contribute, but I want to be part of the change. He hit send, feeling a strange mix of excitement and nervousness. He had no idea what he was getting into, but for the first time in a long while, he felt like he was doing something that mattered. Across the city, Lucas had also been contemplating his place in the world. He'd spent his time reconnecting with old contacts in the journalism world, trying to figure out what his next step was. The debates and protests he'd witnessed on the road had opened his eyes to the power of media in shaping public opinion. As a political reporter, he had always been drawn to the stories of individuals who fought against injustice. But now, the weight of those stories felt more personal. One night after a long day of interviews and catching up with colleagues, Lucas sat in his apartment, staring at the flashing cursor on his laptop screen. He had an article in mind, one that had been brewing for weeks, a deep dive into the state of the American political system, focusing on the ways in which the media and politicians had failed the public. The more he thought about it, the more he realized that this was his calling. He wasn't going to change the world with one article, but he could start conversations, raise awareness, and hopefully inspire others to question the status quo. He typed the headline first, letting the words set the tone for the article. The illusion of change. How American politics continues to fail its people. As he began writing, he felt a renewed sense of purpose. He wasn't going to fix everything, but he could at least bring the issues to light, make sure they weren't swept under the rug. A few days later, the two friends met at their favorite cafe in Brooklyn. They sat across from each other, each with a cup of coffee in hand, and for the first time in weeks the conversation felt easy. No more heavy debates or political arguments, just two friends talking about their lives, their choices, and the future. Jake smiled, leaning back in his chair. I did it. I reached out to Emily. I'm going to join the group, start working on some of the projects. I think this is what I'm supposed to do. Lucas nodded, a small grin on his face. I knew you would. You've always been about action. I think you'll do great work with them. And you, Jake asked, a teasing note in his voice. What's your next move? Planning to run for office or just expose the politicians for now? Lucas chuckled, shaking his head. Nah, I'm not running for office. But I'm going to start writing a series of articles. I think it's time to start digging deeper into the mess we've got ourselves into. The people need to know what's really going on. Jake's expression softened, and he looked out the window at the bustling streets below. You know, we didn't find all the answers out there, but I think we've found our way. It's not about waiting for someone else to fix things. It's about doing what we can with what we've got. Lucas took a sip of his coffee, his thoughts lingering on the journey they'd shared. Yeah, it's about the little things. And it's about waking up every day and doing something, even if it feels small. The sun was setting outside, casting a warm golden glow over the city. For the first time in a long while, both of them felt like they were exactly where they needed to be. The road had led them back home, but more importantly, it had led them to a deeper understanding of what it meant to be part of something bigger than themselves. I think we're on the right path. Jake said quietly, a sense of peace settling in his chest. Lucas nodded. Yeah, we might not have all the answers, but we're doing something. And that's enough. And with that, they sat in comfortable silence, the noise of the city surrounding them, but their hearts filled with a quiet confidence. 
they had learned that change didn't come from waiting for someone else to act. It came from the choices they made every day and the courage to keep moving forward.